And here we are with Antietam. Early morning. How will it fall out today? We start with Mansfield in his 12th Corps, crossing the Antietam. Burnside's 9th Corps edges forward. Next is Cedric's 2nd Corps. Now they've been ordered to go around the hill here because getting up on the hill will open them up to artillery fire. McClellan moves the artillery up onto the heights along the Antietam. Fitz John Porter, the Lion of Antietam, advances towards the Southern Bridge to menace it. And Hooker's First Corps opens up festivities by charging the Southern Line. Hearing trouble on the left flank, Stuart's cavalry advances up to support. And now Hooker's Assault. <laughs> Suffering only light casualties, Hooker's troops push Jackson's men off the hill. And now it's mid-morning. Sumner's Corps occupies the East Woods. Hooker is ordered to sweep down the Confederate line. Ewell is facing away, having recently retreated, so he presents no field of fire to the advancing Union troops. The Union artillery opens up on the Confederate troops it can see with great effectiveness. The rest of our artillery fires at the southern troops it sees across the interior with some effect. Mansfield's Corps charges into the West Woods. Burnside's Corps continues its inexorable advance. Pleasanton's cavalry heads south to probe the southern flank. The northern assault is beyond the range of Longstreet's artillery, but they can see the Union artillery up on the hill. <coughs> However, their fire is ineffective. They can't see this artillery because the woods obscures their view. Fortunately, that protects them also. Stewart's cavalry charges into the flank of the attacking Union troops. Jackson reorganizes his troops and keeps them back out of artillery range. He sends Ewell's men to recapture the left flank. And now the swirling combat in the center. Without the orders rules, I would have fallen back from them. But Jackson's orders are not to run at the first sign of trouble. They are to hold. Amidst the swirling combat, Jackson's troops fall back. Stuart has taken heavy losses, stemming the northern tide. And now Ewell's attack. The fighting by Dovenberger's mill is inconclusive. Turn three, late morning. Franklin and his sixth corps will arrive. Franklin's sixth corps arrives and will hide behind the ridge. The Union troops are still beyond the Longstreet's artillery's range. These two artillery pieces can't see each other because this woods is in the way. But the artillery can see this artillery. This block is behind the slope. The Union artillery is silenced. Hooker organizes his corps and presses forward. Meade's division moves up and Ricketts' division hits Ewell's division in the flank. Jackson ain't no fool. He's ordered a new limit of advance, as it's called in the order's rules. The line runs along here. His troops begin falling back as they occupy the new limit of advance. Now with the Chitra simulating simultaneous movement and different initiatives, one concept that's critical with pub battles is that even if a block has been contacted, it can move when activated. Now when you see this, it might look strange, like, well, they moved up to attack, and now he just moves away and they're standing there. What is actually simulating is they weren't able to get the attack they wanted. Maybe this was actually a combat going on here and they just simply fell back. Or they assumed Jackson was up there, excuse me, that Ewell was up there, prepared for the attack, got there, and found out that he had already left. Point is, at the end of the turn, that's how it looks. Hooker's attack failed to succeed, as planned. Though it can also simulate him simply maneuvering the Confederates out of position. They saw it was coming and they said nope, and they fell back. So he was able to capture the hill without any fighting. Pub Battles lets you create the narrative. McClellan pulls his artillery out of danger. The artillery on the hill fires again on Longstreet's troops. Anderson's troops fall back under the fire. Now, again, I choose to believe that they still might be up there, but they're so disorganized from the bombardment that were another enemy unit to approach, they'd simply fall back in disorganization until they get rallied and ordered back up there. 
Now this last artillery piece can't fire at this artillery piece because one thing, I think they're out of range. Oh, well, I guess they're in range. But more importantly, they can't fire over the heads of their own troops. Next is Stuart's Cavalry Corps. Now cavalry does not need to use the orders rules. They can move as they choose. Now I could move here and present a threat. But if they get attacked and have to retreat, they're off the board and eliminated. Maybe I don't want to do that. One of his blocks has already been eliminated. They were killed earlier. So if I lose this, I have no cavalry. I don't like that. They're going to fall back here to safety. Speaking of cavalry, Pleasanton's cavalry arrive at the top of the slope and watch warily. Now the Union player is facing a conundrum. To keep his artillery activated, he needs to have an unpacked baggage train here. But all three of his baggage trains are attached to core, which are over here. The closest one is Sumner's baggage, second core. But you can't just, his orders say to go this way. You can't just turn part of the unit around and go the other way. So what I have to do is this turn, change his orders, and draw a line of advance along here. By doing that, that baggage train moves to there. I unpack it, and the rest of his core turns and moves back here. Now next turn, I'll change these orders again. These are unpacked, they stay here. These troops turn around and go back up this way. Thus showing the confusion on the field. Now maybe that isn't realistically exactly what happened, but when using the orders rules, what you end up with is the feeling of, I can't just move everything where I want it to move. I have to do it in a certain procedure. You get the removed sense where you can't just move every little piece the way you want. So basically, Summer's core gets held up for a turn while the bags get pulled off. And last we have Mansfield's core. Mansfield's core has been ordered to charge ahead. Late combat, you have Mansfield's core and Jackson's core. Ewell's division is under attack. Those guys are getting no rest. And they finally break. They are destroyed. Manfield's lead element falls back and his division in reserve moves forward. Now what do you think Jackson's orders are going to be? What would you do? Maintain this line? These are both detachments. Not really strong enough to defeat a, a division. The only divisions Jackson has left is his own division here and D.H. Hill's division here they're both spent. The only advantage he has is that the Union troops are pretty broken up here. Burnside's division is fresh, but they're at least two turns away from reaching the line. But this fresh division of Mansfield in here is troublesome. Jackson is going to elect to draw a new line. And he wonders where AP Hill is. Turn four, midday. Burnside surges forward. Hooker presses ahead. He anticipates possibly needing some help and unpacks bags. Stuart rides forward to break up the Union advance. Since Stuart is mounted, they can ride away from the infantry before combat begins. But because he's there, Mansfield is not gonna be able to push forward. Sumner Second Corps, now their bags are unpacked, unpacked and can't move, gets new orders to advance towards Sharpsburg. He can get to the sunken road. The Union artillery, with the unpacked bags, this artillery recovers. This artillery continues to bombard the hill, driving the southerners from the hill. Here's Fitz John Porter's troops. They'd love to go up there and occupy the hill. But that's not their orders. We'll have to change our orders next turn. Longstreet unpacks bags. Boom. And he rallies Anderson and McClaws. And Hood's Texans occupy the hill. So that the southern artillery does not fire at Burnside's corps in the flank and destroy it, Franklin's corps charges the artillery. With the bags unpacked, Mansfield rallies his spent troops. Pleasanton's cavalry moves slightly to the south, and Jackson establishes his new line of defense. Turn four combat. In the front is Longstreet's artillery. It fires first. Getting one hit. Holcomb gets three hits, eliminating the artillery. The Confederates drive back the lead troops, but when their support troops move up, they fall back as well. And it is enough to push back the other Confederate troops, throwing them into confusion. It's turn five, mid-afternoon. A.P. Hill arrives. Burnside's orders tell him to sweep around Sharpsburg. 
Now I notice I forgot to do this combat. All that would have happened was before the combat, Stuart would have ridden away. Hooker's first corps. Now this is interesting. Hooker deployed Beggs ready for a fight, but Jackson has fallen back. Hooker will advance as per his orders, right up to there, and now they're quite a ways away from these unpacked bags. Now this gets critical because we're already on turn five, so say somebody is going to go back and recover. Well, it's a turn going back, then a turn recovering, then a turn moving back towards the troops, by which now the line's going to be even further away. That's three turns. Five and three is eight. Game over. So essentially, this has become useless. Although it did rally one unit. McClellan's artillery fires at the Confederates on the hill. One hit. These are Hood's Texans. They're elite. They ignore that hit. No effect. The artillery is moved back up on the hill here. Now positioning your artillery is tricky because you want to be not blocked by your own troops and not threatened by the enemy troops. So once the battle gets going, you have to be very careful about where you move up your artillery to. And with all the Union artillery underneath McClellan, wherever you draw that line, everyone's going to move up there. I have a plan, but we'll see. Another critical thing to note here is that all the Southern artillery has been lost. Longstreet rallies all his units. Hood's Texans come off the hill to seal the breach in the line. He'd like to bring Walker's troops over here, or down here even, to, present, to prevent an open hole in his line. But he doesn't know what's out here. He knows there's cavalry out here. He can't just abandon this either. Sumner has been ordered to sweep through Sharpsburg. Now regular pub battles rules state that when a block enters building's terrain, when this Sharpsburg building's terrain, it becomes spent, disorganized. I use a home rule, but the rule I use simply says they cannot rally from spent when they're in a town or building's terrain, as it's called. You can play either way. It doesn't end the game, it doesn't ruin the game, it works either way. The reason I do it is because originally, before the baggage train rules, a unit that was not, once you moved out of the train, you'd be, you could flip up to fresh. You automatically rallied if you didn't move. Now we have bags, and you have to be by bags to rally. So since rallying is a little tougher, I make it less likely that you become spent. But when you do become spent, you do have problems. Now DHL is spent and even if he weren't in building's terrain, he couldn't rally because he's in combat. He's supporting you in combat, and you can't rally under those conditions. And by the way, these three are just detachments. They're going to melt. Well, there you have it. My camera battery died, and I didn't know it was dead until I went to edit the video. So, I don't have the very end of the battle. But, as I suggested, as I suspected and feared, the Confederate line evaporated. The following turn, Lee packed up bags and left. By packing up bags and leaving, it becomes a Union minor victory. But because he was able to pack them up as opposed to having the Union capture him, he avoided, he denied, a Union decisive victory. It was a good game, and the game before this my mic wasn't working right, and that one was completely unusable. So even though this one is less than perfect, I didn't want to go three times in a row before I got a decent game I could, I could edit. So this is what we have. Now an interesting, cool effect of using the new orders rules, which are, I say new, they're still in development, so they don't even really exist yet. This is part of my playtesting process. But you can see how the line looks more natural, more like a historical line of battle, and not the pell-mell mixture of chaotic units everywhere. The more the simulation mirrors history, the better simulation it is. Thank you for joining me this Fighting Friday. And hey, it really means a lot if you, if you leave a like and, and even a brief message. Uh, you can tell me what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. It helps me improve video by video. Alright, see you next Friday.